Coming up on our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community worldwide in 2021, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1138 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The FCC Enforcement Bureau warns property owners and managers of significant new financial penalties for allowing illegal or pirate broadcasting on their property. A Volunteer Examiner Coordinator Testing Group in Oregon offers testing from the comfort of candidates' cars. We'll have the story. The SAQ Alternator will experience a silent night this Christmas Eve due to COVID restrictions. A scheduled slow-scan television event from the space station will help mark 20 years of continuous amateur radio operations from the ISS. A U.S. government agency believes RF transmissions are responsible for employee illnesses overseas. There are some amateur radio events that are proceeding on schedule despite pandemic restrictions, while others have been totally canceled. We will tell you who is up and who is down. New Zealand has posted changes to their general user radio license. Finland radio amateurs are asking for an allocation at 1240 to 1300 megahertz. And what do you do if you are in a major disaster with no internet? We will have the story on some interesting technology you can build to stay connected in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. This week is our special Christmas edition, and coming right up, we will have a great amateur radio story told by one of the 20th century's best storytellers on the radio, the late Gene Shepard, K2ORS, as heard back in the 60s on WORAM in New York City. We'll also have the late Bill Barron, N2FNH, who will be here with a reading of A Ham's Christmas Packet. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will tell us how to disable notifications in Google Chrome, and we'll revisit the new proposed network technology from Amazon called Sidewalk. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLAB, says that if you want to do HF operations in your apartment building, where do you start? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill will talk about broadcasting in the pre-crystal controlled era and the new government regulations setting up a new amateur radio regulator and officially recognizing amateur radio for the first time. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will have a few general antenna mounting tips when you are up on your tower. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in Albany, New York, where Snowmageddon 2020 has occurred, where we had 36 inches of snow. That's three feet of snow here at our studio. Oh, and I forgot to say, I'm George, W2XBS. Happy holidays. And reporting from our news bureau, just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our radio outpost high atop the Catskill Mountains in western New York, where we've just finished shoveling 32 inches of fine skiing powder off of the driveway. <sighs> I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau in Troy, New York, where 18 inches of snow this week has made it easy to stay home and stay safe, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2RJX. And from our soon-to-be-renovated Studio 1 of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our news bureau in Northwest Arkansas, where the snow was here and now it's gone. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. Season's greetings. This is W2XBS. I would like to take a moment to wish all of our affiliates and listeners across the country and around the world all of the best of the holiday season. And it's our present to you, 
Please sit back and enjoy one of the nation's best storytellers talk about being a kid and getting on amateur radio. Now, for your enjoyment, here is Gene Shepard, the late K2ORS, as heard on one of his broadcasts on WOR Radio in New York during the mid-1960s. I'm for Gene Shepard, author, raconteur, and commentator of the contemporary scene. Here's Gene. Uh, I remember very cleanly and distinctly the, the excitement that Friday night meant. It's a fantastic, it, it always will. Uh, even to guys who are not in school, who are still not 15, uh, Friday night is a special, peculiar kind of a dangerous night. And what it meant to me, I have to, I have to admit one terrible thing uh, at, at one point in my life, what it really meant to me was Friday night was the one night that I could keep my ham station going until dawn. I did not have to get up early in the next morning. Even my paper route did not work uh, early morning Saturday. The paper was not delivered on Saturday morning. I made my collections Saturday afternoon, but I could stay up all night. And I would come, I'd come home from a date, you know, the whole scene, I'd have the, I'd have the whole bit going. And about, about 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, I'm with this girl. We're having a malt, you know. We're sitting in the drive-in watching Charlie Chan or some other big uh, opus of the period. I'm, I'm, uh, I can hardly wait, you know, I keep hearing it in my mind. I keep hearing the CQs on 40. I said, oh boy, there must be, gee, right now, about now, the West Coast must be coming in. Right about now, the, the W6s are starting to pound into the 9th District. And here I am sitting with uh, Esther Jane, you know. <laughs> I mean, Esther Jacobs saying, gee, what, a, a penny for your thoughts. And I'd say, yeah, well, a penny for my thoughts. What was, what'd you say? What? What? She'd say, a penny for your thoughts. And I'd think for a minute, and I'd say, shall I tell her about that pie section network I was thinking of in my mind? This pie section network, I got a terrific idea to change the standing wave ratio on my 600 ohm feed on my 40, my 40 meter step. Shall I tell her about that? And then it would come out, you know, and I'd say, yeah, yeah, okay. And I'd say, you know, Esther, what I was thinking of that, uh, that there is in the handbook, in the ARRL handbook, there's a terrific section on pie section networks. And I wonder if you'd like to go home with me and the two of us will build a pie section network that will reduce the standing wave ratio on the 600 ohm feeds to my 40 meter. And by that time, I'd see her drifting away. And she'd be looking out of the front window of the car now, and she's watching Charlie Chan again. I said, what's the matter? What's the matter? Just think of the fun we could have together. Y you could hold the solder, and I could take the soldering iron. And I'd say, give me the solder. Quick, 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 quick. Come on. Now put a plier down there. Hold it on that, on that terminal. Like, Psh! Oh, boy, would we have fun. And it'd be this long, pregnant silence. And I recognized that, once again, I had mighty Casey had struck out. And, and I could not, I, I knew then there were certain things that you just didn't talk to chicks about. Pie section networks, you do not discuss mercury switching systems with chicks. You do not discuss a class C final with a chick. And <laughs> you, don't, you don't even discuss the, the ineffable mysteries of the universe of that kind with a girl. And I remember one period I was, I was plunged into a profound funk, a real funk, and oddly enough, just the other night, I'm looking in the newspaper, I'm sitting there, and I'm down at the Horn and Hard Arts, you know, and I got my egg cup in front of me and a big cup of Horn and Hard Arts coffee, and I'm just casually going through the paper. And it was a paper that I found there. It was, it was on, somebody's, on somebody's table. I'm just going through it. And suddenly, Skip, a name hit me. A name just stuck right out of the headlines there. Now, you we're used to big, you know, regular names like President Johnson, Dean Rusk, and Charles de Gaulle, Mickey Mantle and stuff. It was a name? I says, no, it can't be. It can't be. And it was an obituary. And sure enough, there it was, the name of a man who probably nobody in the entire Horn and Hard Art, probably, I would say, anybody on 6th Avenue at that moment, sitting in coffee shops, sitting in H&H's, and sitting in Bickford's, wherever they might be, if I ran from one of those tables to the other and says, Look! Look! Look who died! Look at the name! Do you remember the name? The name would mean nothing to them. To how many of you does the name Heising mean anything? Did you ever hear of Heising modulation? Heising modulation. You know, there aren't many men in, in any field 
who give their name to an entire system or an entire uh, formula or a new discovery. You know, like the Salk vaccine. We all know the Salk vaccine. Uh, Dr. Salk's name will be familiar and will be famous for, for generations, the name Salk vaccine. We know about Freud, you know, the, the Freud dream analysis ideas and, and Dr. Freud's hypotheses and so on. We know about Einstein's theory of relativity. Well, Heising lived over here in Jersey. He died just a, just a couple of days ago. And I caught the name, and it was connected with one of the peculiar, long, blue funk moments I've ever had in my life. The Heising system of modulation is a system of AM amplitude modulation. Now, you're listening to me in most likelihood, if you're listening to 710 on your dial, I know you are, you're listening to amplitude modulation. That's AM radio. Uh, the other kind of radio is connected with another man. That's the FM radio. What's the name of the man, uh, really, who was generally credited at being, uh, uh, being the genuine developer of FM radio? Come on, who is it? Uh, what kind of an engineer are you, for crying out? You know who it is. Why, he was, uh, there. isn't that sad? The great men of our time, hardly any, Major Armstrong. Oh, for heaven's sakes. He also was uh, involved in the, in the superheterodyne theories. That's another thing. There was a great man. But the name Heising, it, it became so mystical, so involved in my life, like a coal pits oscillator, for example. I wonder, I wonder if old man coal pits, who invented a certain type of oscillator, knew that for, for years and years and years there would be a little diagram in uh, question and answer manuals, in ARL handbooks, it would say, coal pits oscillator. Now, now, I, I'm not talking to you about radio here, so don't get bored here. I'm talking to you about something else. Can you imagine your name, let's say Witherspoon or uh, Aschenschlager? Let's say if, if, if there were textbooks to be printed for a hundred years from that, and it would say Aschenschlager's Law of Rottenness. And forever and ever, people would know the name Aschenschlager, and it's, it's not even a, a man anymore. It's, it's just a name. It's a name. Heising was not a man to me, and I was astounded to find a Mr. Heising died, and I read the obit, and it was the one. It really was the Heising who had created this system of modulation. Well, let me tell you, uh, speaking, speaking of bad modulation, this is WOR AM and FM New York. <laughs> Now, I'm not going to go into a technical description of what the Heising system of modulation is. I could go into that. That's for next semester. Uh, we won't do that tonight, but I will, I will tell you this, that I am now on CW. See, I'm a kid. I'm about 14 years old. I'm a ham. And my whole life is, is connected with this stuff. And, and, of course, I was also involved in other things, like I'm playing football and I'm playing second base and, and I'm going out with Esther Jane Alberry and I'm going out with Don Strickland and I've got all the chicks going. You know, the whole scene is a gigantic fruitcake of existence. And connected with all of it, of course, and somehow weaving through it in, in this tapestry was this thing of back home in the front bedroom, my shack. And this was my special place, my shack. You know, the day bed is over here and the, the windows are over here. And the shack was a, was a bedroom we did not use. It was my shack. And I had this old table that I had bought from the Salvation Army for a dollar. And I'd cleaned it and I'd put formica on the top of it and polished it. I had a little vice on the side of it, you know. And I had, I had the desk drawers all cleaned out. And I had compartments in there where I had resistors and condensers. And I had all the whole scene. I had a clipboard off to the left where I kept my log sheets and, and my plate readings and my grid drive readings and all that. And I had a rack. I had a four and a half foot rack that I bought. I bought it in an old used radio store, a place where you buy old radio junk, you know. And I bought this rack, and it's a big four and a half foot rack, and it had big 19, 19 and a half inch panels across of it. And in it, this big four and a half foot rack, which is a great big piece of iron, I had a 10 watt transmitter. <laughs> that was the joy, the light of my life. It was CW, and every night uh, when all the other kids, you know, were sort of just hanging around the living room and walking around picking their teeth and crying and whining and looking out of the window and and the yelling down the hot air register, you know, the stuff that kids do, I would be in the front bedroom in my shack with my key. The time that Uncle Tom gave me that key, I will for, forever remember. He gave me an old railroad, beautiful railroad key with a side winder, you know, a real key, see. And 
and I would be down there at uh, maybe 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and I'm on there with my cans, my Brandy's earphones hanging on my head, and I'm on 40 meters. My 6L6 is laying it down on 40, and I'm right there in the middle of the band. 7182 was my Bliley X-Cut crystal, and I am number one on 7182. And my, my rig had such poor voltage regulation, Skip, that the entire house, when I would press the key down, the lights would go, and about every ten minutes, my old man was, would come back. Well, you cut out that. I can't even read now already. I'd say, okay, Dad, all right. I'd sit there, and then I'd go, wait for a couple of minutes. I'd wait till, you know, you always wait till the ripples sort of die down. And the, the talk builds up again out there, and then I go, do, 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 do. a few little V's, you know. <laughs> I am laying it out on 40. So this is my whole life. I walk around the streets with, with Esther Jane or with Helen Weathers or with uh, Dorothy or one of the chicks I was going with, and I would hear a horn. A car would go past, you see. And uh, I hear that old horn blow. You always hear this. If you're, if you're a real CW man, you hear it, and you can never get rid of it. You hear it all the time. I stand next to subway trains right now on 59th Street, and they come along, you know, and I hear the doors rattling and everything, and I hear them. They say things in coach. He goes past roaring out of CQ, you know. It's the double A train. I can hear a CQ just as plain, just as plain and easy. You know? I'm walking down the street with Helen Weathers or with Dorothy Anderson and I hear the horns, you know, the horn goes some guy sends a K. I turn around and go and there's a dull silence there. And then I'd hear obscenities. I'd, I'd walk along and somebody'd send, send an obvious obscenity. He doesn't know he's doing it, you know. He'd just say, bah, 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 bah. I'd, <laughs> I'd dig with Dorothy. And I said, Do you hear what he said? She, she said, What? And of course, the word got out that I was kind of a nut. You know, kids who do things that all other kids don't do are always, always kind of looked upon as the nut, the crowd. Well, about that time, it was maybe about a year after I got on CW. And uh, I was going up for my Class A examination. Now, this is a special exam that you take that involves amplitude modulation. It's about telephone, radio telephone, this whole business that we're involved in right now. Right now you and I, you're, you're listening to me on a, on a radio set. I'm talking to you on an amplitude modulation transmitter and so forth. Well, that was that whole theory, diagrams and the whole business. And there was one special section called the theory, the adjustment, and the maintenance of the Heising modulation system. And I got involved in that. Somehow I, I began to dig this system. I liked to, it had a nice had a nice symmetry about its diagrams. It was a nice somehow I dug the theory of the Heising system. <laughs> Don't ask me why, I can tell you now. One thing, it's cheaper than most other systems. And, and, and I began to dig this Heising modulation system. And then I began to go down to, uh, to the old surplus radio stores, and I began to look for chokes, filter chokes and stuff that I could build, I could use to make this Heising system. And it became almost the next big goal. You know, as we all live in our lives, uh, whatever little life we have, we have goals achieved and goals about to be achieved, and we have goals we're aiming at. All the time. So a guy may live uh, during a certain period in his life, and his, his idea is get a boat, get a boat. And he walks around the street, and he thinks about boat, 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 boat. Or, or he, he, he may have this thing, uh, uh, get a promotion, uh, get to be the uh, chief clerk, get, uh, get to be the chief clerk. And he thinks about this all the time, get to be the chief clerk. Other guys have the thing, yeah, I'm going to make money on the at and I'm gonna make I'm gonna make dough. You see, the the reason we we dig horse racing uh, and 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 the stock market and that kind of thing is because you can see goals achieved and also goals failed. That's part of it. And so our, each life, each day is a whole series of little goals. Uh, gee, if I can only get away to get a get a cup of coffee. Holy smokes! If I can only get away to get a cup of coffee. Oh wow, wow! And you go for about a half an hour. So you're working away there, and then all of a sudden you say, "I'm gonna go." I'm going to go and get a cup of coffee. And boom, the next thing you know, you're sitting down there at that good old chock full of nuts, and a coffee's out there, and a goal has been achieved. A goal has been achieved. Bing, it's big, you know. It's there, you see. 
And there I was beginning to develop this thing, and Heising modulation. Now, I know <laughs> this means nothing to you, but millions of hams are listening, and they're saying, yeah, man, yeah. Well, at that same time, there was a girl that I was really hung up on. I don't even remember this girl's name. It was one of those brief, momentary things, you know, where you get hung up on a chick. I remember she had dark hair, and she had sort of pink, light-type skin. And I remember she lived on the north side of town. And I remember I used to ride over there about every second day with my Elgin bicycle, like mad through the gloam, just to look at her house, you know, that kind of thing. Just to ride past her house once in a while, like, hey, wow, look out! She'd never look out. But once in a great while, I'd see her at the tennis court, that kind of thing. And I had a big hang-up on this chick. And at the same time, I had a hang-up on Heising modulation. Well, one day, I'm in this store, this old junky store that we used to go to. Uh, I'm, I'm down in the Ace Radio Shop. It's a crummy old, lousy radio shop. They have millions of piled-up turntables of old, uh, disreputable types, you know, wound for Bulgarian capitals, special types of winding that only work on six-and-a-half bolts or some nutty thing like that, or 18-and-a-third bolts, and all kinds of crazy equipment. And I came across the, the transformer. It was perfect for my Heising modulation. Well, I had about a dollar. That was about as much as I could go. And old Sam, back at the counter there, at the, at the Ace Radio Shop, is looking me right in the eye, and he says, A buck, are you kidding? Do you realize it's a 300 mil transformer? What are you talking about, Mac? You don't find many of them anymore. That's a 300 mil Ford Darson transformer. And I... There I'm there, confronted with it. Well, that night, I had a date. I had one dollar. This son of a gun wanted two and a half for this transformer. Now, I had a total, probably a total stake at the time, of about three bucks, of which one dollar was to go for a transformer that day, or something else. Maybe I wanted to buy it. Whatever I was going to get was going to be a buck, see. I figured two bucks, well, we'll go down to the Orpheum, me and this chick, and it'll leave us uh, enough to get a hamburger over at Minor and Dunn's. And, uh, well, you know, it'll work out pretty good. I'll maybe squeak by with an extra quarter or two. I had it all figured out. Well, Sam looked me in the eye. I looked Sam in the eye. And right there on that counter in front of us, it was laying right there. Now, this is the curse that all men have had to face all the time. All men I know. Is it going to be a boat? Or... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, indeed. I don't think chicks have these kind of decisions to make quite as often as men. They may in the future. But men always have these little things, you know. They do. They have to decide whether or not to be a social animal or a rotten, crummy, selfish animal. Now, usually they, do, they devise it in such a way in their mind to be both. And so the guy will say, well, if I buy this transformer, I will be a happier person to be with. Not only that, I will, be, I will be more fulfilled. And then I could certainly be able to fulfill my role with Esmeralda much. But actually, I'm, I'm investing in her, if you look at it in a certain way. If you look at it a certain way, in a certain light, that the best thing I could do for her would be to buy this 300 mil Thor Darson transformer and build up my Heising modulation system, and from there on in it would be hotsy totsy. That's, well, that's the way my mind went. So, five minutes later, I am going home with this big transformer under my all oh, that excitement, you know. I had all the other stuff, you know, I was all ready to go. And that afternoon, I'm building and soldering, getting this thing going. You know, I got, a, I got the diagrams out, and I'm working down the circuit, the circuit values. And I've, I've, you know, I'm hinching a little bit, you know. I got a couple of things where it says 0 0.2 micro micro farad condenser i got a point one you know little things like that all the way down you go for me. i'll make it work you know the, the, the resistor that it should have been let's say 1500 ohms i had one that was 2700 ohms uh, you know what's uh, that's close enough for jazz you know <laughs> so well anyway it's now about five o'clock or six o'clock there thereabouts and i have built my first modulator i don't know whether you know the excitement friends i i don't know how i can transmit this to you of going on the air for the first time on your transmitter. Now, I'm not talking about CB. This is nothing. This is kid stuff. Come on. None of that junk. And, and by the way, many people today confuse amateurs for CBers. They're totally different animals, completely. 
There is no parallel between... Uh, a sea beer bears about the same relationship to an amateur as a little grandmother riding along the West Side Highway in her 47 Plymouth bears to Sterling Moss. <laughs> it's about the same, isn't it? Roughly, yeah. They ain't at all the same thing. Don't confuse them at all. And so I, I, I've got this Heising modulation system all done. I've got a 6L6 tube in the final. I got a dummy load on it. And I'm all set to try it out, test the whole thing out. I got the microphone, I got a, a single button carbon mic, put the gain on, turn it all on, and then I, I stand back with the mic and I'm ready to go. And I've got my, I, I was using to test my modulation system, I have a two watt neon bulb, which I could see, <laughs> it was about as close. And of course I had a milliammeter, I had an ammeter in the, in the plate and so on. And so she's heating up. Slowly, I apply the plate voltage. I had a variac, and I'm applying the plate voltage to my final. He's now up to 700 volts. A lot of voltage on that poor old 6L6. She's a bright, brisk, cherry red, you know, and I said, well, maybe I'll back it down a little bit. I go down a couple of notches, and I'm now, I got about 500 volts on the plate. And then I switch in my Heising modulation. <laughs> And there's one moment, just a moment of pause, when suddenly, without any warning, it goes... I get this fantastic chatter in my transformer. I back it down. I look in. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I turn off the switches. Get off the diagram. I'm checking it over here. Check, 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 check. Everything checks out. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Let's see here. Well, maybe I had just too much gain on the input there. Maybe she was overloading, motorboating. That's it. She's probably motorboating. So I turn it on again. I stand back and wait. Everything in my, my 6L6's glow, this nice cherry glow, and I turn up the gain a little bit. Hello. Hello. One, two, three, four. Hello. 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 Ooh, for crying out loud, I back it down a little bit. Hello. Hello. By the way, Mr. Heising was doing this to me, in case you don't know it. The man who just passed into the great beyond over in Jersey. Hello, 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 hello. And it was the first time that I'd ever encountered one of the major curses of mankind. Downward modulation. Now that means nothing to your friends. <laughs> Except suffice it to say that when old Shep talks to you here, uh, the, the uh, transmitted signal of WOR goes up. As my voice goes up, the transmitter, the signal goes up. Well, my transmitter was working the opposite. As I would talk into it, it would go down. <laughs> and I'm holding the thing up there. Hello, 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 hello. And now it's getting about 7 o'clock, see. Hello, hello, one, two, three, four. Oh, what a curse. And I could not get... And, and by that time, I just said, well, there must be something wrong. I'm not checking it right, so I'll call CQ. Hello, CQ, hello, CQ, hello, CQ, hello, CQ. And I'm tuning back. Hello, I'm on 160, in case you're interested in the band. Hello, CQ, hello. And I stand by. And immediately, a guy comes back right on the frequency. Gong! W9QWN, W9QWN. Fantastic signal, W9QWN, W9QWN. This is W9XXX standing by. Do you hear me, old man? <laughs> oh, uh, W9XXX, yeah, this is W9QWN uh, here. You're uh, Q5R9 plus here, old man. I handle here a Shep, S-H-E-P, Shep. Handle here a Shep, we're running a single 6L6. Uh, about uh, 10 watts, uh, Heising modulation, uh, modulated by a single 10, uh, by a single 6L6 here, and a single button carbon mic. I'm using a 40 meter zip on the harbor ladder tomorrow. Okay, W9XXX, uh, W9QWN uh, standing by. Kunk. Kunk. That signal comes back. W9QWN, this is W9XXX uh, here. I recognized him as one of the great famous hams of the area. You know, it's like talking. It's like if you're an aviation nut and all of a sudden you're hooked up with Lindbergh. You know, I mean, you're down at the flying club and you two are discussing flying together. You know. And he comes back to me and he says, mm, uh, What did you say the uh, handle was? I don't remember working you before. I just thought I'd call you. You're messing up the band. Uh, you're you're lousing up the frequency here. It sounds to me like you've got a little downward modulation, and I don't think you're final. It, it sounds a little bit like you're a lot of parasitics there. And uh, not only that, it sounds to me just a little bit like your neutralization is way off, man. Just thought I'd call you. I didn't want to get involved in any long rag, you. Uh, you better look into it, old man, and uh, 
I'm going to QR, QRT now. I think I'll pull a switch and uh, don't bother to come back. You sound rotten. Uh, don't bother to come back, old man. Uh, it's all right, fellow. Uh, your signal here is about, I'd say, around a Q3, Q2 to 3, about an R2. Well, that meant that he had to turn up everything he had just to hear me. And when he did turn it up to hear me, I was just rotten. Uh, and so I <laughs> he just, goom, he's gone. I'm sitting. Icing my isolation, eh? Yeah, I turn it on again. I take my neon bulb. This time I put the I put the, the dummy load in. See, I'm not going to radiate all over the band. And I get on there. Hello, hello. Keeps flickering downward. It's now 8.30, quarter to nine. My check has been waiting for me since 7. It's at 7 o'clock. Well, I finally realize, you know, this is, this is, this is, this is, this way lies madness. In this way lies the antisocial animal. And uh, once you have committed yourself to the antisocial animal forever, you'll be down in some dank basement, surrounded by half-empty ball jars full of nails. The rest of your life will be given over to this insanity, whatever it is. I knew that even then, as an animal. I knew even then that hang-ups can devour you. And so, about quarter to nine, I looked at this thing, I says, oh, okay, I turned it off, and 15 minutes later, I am picking up this chick, and 10 minutes after that, we are on our way to the Aragon. We are on our way to <laughs> this place where they had these terrible bands and stuff, see, and all the way on up, all I could think of was downward modulation. All I could think of it was like I had failed as a man. <laughs> I wonder, uh, it's too bad that Tennessee Williams doesn't write plays about the things that really get guys going, that really get guys hung up. I have known guys for two solid years, two solid years to be eaten up inside. I mean eaten up, where they yell at their chicks, they threaten to kill their daughters, they, they, they take a shot at their boss because of one thing, they get rotten gas mileage. They're getting eight miles to the gallon. And it burns them up every time they go into that gas station. You know, they bought this monster, and it takes 14 gallons of gas just to get the town and back. <gasps> it's like it's like Ahab and that and that whale, you know. And so we are on our way to the Aragon Ballroom. Well, have you ever danced with a chick when you've got a heising system of modulation on your mind with downward modulation and also a bad problem with the par parasitics? All the time I'm hearing parasitics in my mind, and you know, parasitics are awful things. They're like little, uh, well, when you hear parasitics on the air, you know it. It's like a swarm of awful, angry, sort of somehow debauched, erotic locusts. They surround your signal. It's a fuzzy signal. If you could tune past WOR and it sounds like a, like a shaving brush that's been drinking, uh, that would be like my signal was on 160, and I'm bugged. Well, on the way home, after about uh, says, m at least uh, four hours of dancing, it seemed like four hours, went on endlessly, back and forth we're going. We're on our way home, and she turned to me, and she says, I don't want to hurt your feelings. And I said, what, 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 what? I, I, already, you see, I was back in, in, in my shack. You know, I was sitting next to this chick in a Western Avenue car, but I'm already back in the shack, you know, and I've, I've got an idea. I'll tell you what it is. It must be the cathode. It must be my cathode biases. That's it. That's it. I, I, you know, I'm thinking, oh, oh boy, I can hardly wait to get home. Hardly wait to get home. I'm going to change that resistor in there. I know what it is. It's, I know what it is. I know. Oh, oh, what a fool. What a nut. And she says, uh, now, come on. She says, you, I, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but you're one of the you're one of the worst people that I've ever dated. I said, what? <laughs> um, you know, I don't make passes or anything. I'm a nice guy, you know. I took her out there. She said, you're one of the worst people I've ever dated. And she says, not only that, she says, but I think, I think that your mother ought to take you to a doctor. I think you're unhealthy. Unhealthy? It never occurred to me to be having a hang-up on a cathode follower circuit or having a hang-up on Heising modulation was somehow a perversion. It was a sickness. I said, well, unhealthy. I don't mean I play football and all that stuff. What do you mean unhealthy? I'm getting a little bugged with her. What do you mean unhealthy? Anybody with the kind of skin you got should holler about unhealthy, for crying out loud. She says, well, I don't care. She's bugged. Oh, a woman scorned, even at the age of 14, is, is hell on wheels. That's all I got to say. So I'm saying, well, what do you mean unhealthy? She says, well, I don't think you even talked to me once tonight. What do you mean talk to you? Didn't I buy an orange drink? I bought you knee-high. I talked. I said, I asked you if you wanted another one. I remember that. I said, it's fun. 
Now, I remember telling you this was fun. She said, you did not talk to me once, all the time we were at the Erica. Long pregnant pause. I said, what am I going to talk to you? What, do you know anything about downward modulation? She says, what? I said, well, I've got worries. I'm worried. Now, can't you tell I'm worried? <laughs> Nothing is worried, more worried than a guy who is building something and it hasn't worked. I can tell you this, it drives you out of your skull. I said, I'm worried. And we rode all the way home on the Western Avenue car in silence. Got to the end of the line, took her home, says goodbye. Just goodbye. That was the end of that. I took off like a big speckled bird. <laughs> I'll tell you, I didn't think of her. It's eight seconds off. I'm ooh, over the privet hedge as I'm going, you know. I'm flying all the way home with my wings going, you know. Wow. Woo, up the front porch. Boom, in. Pow, into the front bedroom. Goom, goom, goom. The switches are going on. The old man sitting out in the front room there listening to the A&P gypsies or something, you know. And I got, I got all the switches turned on, everything going, waiting for it to heat up. I got the soldering iron heating up, and I've got the solder out there, and I have got that two micro micro farad condenser which I should have put in in the very beginning in the cathode it hit me halfway through red sails in the sunset what the problem was halfway through I just I what, what's the matter with me I got a I got a one-tenth condenser in there it should have been a two at least a two micro micro farad shh, shh, shh. I'm soldering this thing up you know boy I heat this baby on there I got the microphone going dummy load all right let's see Putting in a little grid drive there. Now she's, oh boy, she's doing real good. Oh, boop, ah. I tune the final plate. Ooh, what a dip. I'm tuning that final tank now. Ooh. Ooh. Advance the gain a little bit. Hello, one, two. Oh, what a beautiful sight. What a beautiful sight. My milliameter in the final plate is ticking up. Ever so slightly. Ding, 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 ding. Up, oh, she's, she's working perfectly. I take my neon bone. Hello, one, two, three, four. Oh, hello, hello. Hello, 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 hello. One, two, three, four. Hello. Beautiful envelope. Magnificent signal. Pow. Out comes the dummy load. In goes my 600 ohm Zep V. Boom, boom. I'm tuning her up, oh man. Up to the full 10 watts. Hello, 160. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. Look at that meter flicking up in there now. Look at it right behind your head, Skip. Look at that beautiful sight. Hello, hello. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. Calling CQ. I sat there until I was red in the face calling CQ. This is W9QWN calling CQ and listening. I developed that real snotty way, you know. And listening, come in there, boom. I'd wait. Of course, the band was one solid mass of heterodynes. I could hear nothing. Just whoo, all the big timers are coming in. It's late at night. And then finally, about one o'clock in the morning, I hear this guy calling. Hello, W9QWN, W9QWN. This is W8LFD in Cleveland, Ohio, calling. Hello, 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 W9. Oh, fantastic moment of total joy. You know how the guys who have reached the top of Mount Everest feel? I know that feeling. I know that feeling of standing on the top of a glacier, looking out over the Himalayas. Nothing but achievement. You can't go anywhere after this. There I sat that night, working guys all over the Midwest with my 10-watt Heising system of modulation. And it wasn't until there was a postscript to this. Years later, I am out of the Army. Years later, oh boy, long time afterwards, I am going through a department store. I am home about a week and a half, and I still got my uniform on. And I'm going through a department store in Chicago, and who do I meet but that girl? That same girl. And she's working in one of the big stores. In fact, she was working in Carson, in case you're interested. And there she is. And I couldn't remember the chick's name. And she couldn't remember my name. And she was behind a counter. And we both stood there and I said, say, Ham and High, didn't you go to Ham and High? She says, yes, of course, you, uh, I remember you. I said, I remember you, do you remember the, she says, yes, the Aragon. We stood there for a second. And then she finally says, you know, you were kind of a nut. Did your mother ever take you to the doctor or something? See about that? I said, no, no, that, that 
problem's all cleared up now. It's all cleared up. Little did she know, little did she know that the problem was all cleared up. I was getting upward modulation. You have been listening to Gene Shepard, the late K2ORS, as heard on WOR Radio in New York. Happy holidays from all of us here at This Week in Amateur Radio. Connecting to... The Random Access Christmas. Now, stand by for playback. A Christmas Packet with apologies to Clement Seymour. Twas the night before Christmas, the moon shone so bright, its light on the snow was a beautiful sight. I sat down in my easy chair with a sigh, through the window I stared at the stars in the sky, suddenly I woke to a racket. I knew right away something came in on the packet. I rose from my chair and went back to my shack, while the radio kept up its clackety clack. A brap burst out of my TNC. The headline said that it was for me. This must be a joke, was the thought in my head. D.E. the North Pole was the way that it read. I knew that it must be one of the boys, so I tried to connect to the source of the noise. So quickly I typed, con OK on, but just as fast as it came, it was gone. Then from the parlor I heard a soft thump. And then heard the front door close with a bump. Puzzled, I went to the living room door. And there my eyes were drawn down to the floor. I couldn't believe what I saw by the tree. Earplugs for my wife and a new rig for me. That sneaky old elf, he pulled quite a gag. While I was in the back, he snuck in with his bag. The few minutes I was on, packety pack, gave him just enough time to empty his sack. Then from my set, I heard one last zap. I turned and was back in my shack in a snap. I thought I knew what this message might be, so as I sat down to look at the CRT, this line I read by the screen's tree light. Merry Christmas to all, and to all, a good night. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. And now to the news with this week's lead story. Here's Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. Our lead story this week comes from the FCC. The FCC's Enforcement Bureau today announced it had begun targeting property owners and managers that knowingly tolerate pirate broadcasting on their properties, exercising the Commission's new authority under the recently enacted Pirate Act. Parties that knowingly facilitate illegal broadcasting on their property are liable for fines of up to $2 million. Pirate radio is illegal and can interfere with not only legitimate broadcast stations' business activities, but also those stations' ability to inform the public about emergency information, said Rosemary Harold, chief of the Enforcement Bureau. It is unacceptable and plainly illegal under the new law for landlords and property managers to simply opt to ignore pirate radio operations. Once they are aware of these unauthorized broadcasts, they must take steps to stop it from continuing in their buildings or at other sites they own or control. If they do not do so, they risk receiving a heavy fine followed by collection action in court if they do not pay it. In addition, our enforcement actions will be made public, which may create further unforeseen business risks. Under the new authority, the Enforcement Bureau will provide written notice to property owners and managers the agency has reason to believe are turning a blind eye to or even help facilitate illegal broadcasting. These new notices of illegal pirate radio broadcasting will also afford parties a period of time to remedy the problem before any enforcement action moves forward. In the first such notices issued today to property owners regarding their buildings in New York City, the respective parties were given 10 days to respond. The Bureau will consider any response before taking further action. Commission investigations have found that landlords and property managers too often are aware of this illegal activity taking place on their premises. The Commission has previously sent warnings to landlords and even sought cooperation from national property owners organizations in raising awareness. With pirate broadcasts persisting despite these efforts, Congress took action and empowered the Commission to penalize property owners and managers that knowingly permit pirate broadcasters to remain operating from the landlord's building or unbuilt areas. 
landlords and property managers also may be found liable if a pirate station ceases operation for some period of time but later resumes at the same site. Separately, the Enforcement Bureau and the Office of the Managing Director also released today an order amending the Commission's rules to implement the new enforcement authority granted by Congress through Section 2 of the Pirate Act as codified in 47 U.S.C. 511. The coronavirus pandemic has made life difficult for everyone. On the plus side, however, it's prompted creative solutions to work around the various roadblocks the pandemic has imposed. Volunteer examiners in Grant County, Oregon, affiliated with the ARRL Volunteer Examiner Coordinator, put their heads together to overcome the adversity and hold a safe and secure exam session. With more details on this unique exam session, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this special report from ARRL headquarters. Current health regulations in Oregon precluded both indoor and outdoor gatherings, so the Grant County Amateur Radio Club, the local Aries Group, and the Grant County Emergency Radio Infrastructure Coalition combined forces to offer five candidates the chance to obtain their first license or to upgrade their existing license, all from the comfort of their vehicles. Steve Fletcher, K7AA, who is the Aries Emergency Coordinator for Grant County, told ARRL that the group chose to hold a drive-up exam session on Saturday, December 12th. Fletcher reported three new technician class licensees and two new general class radio amateurs resulted from the session. Required ARRL VEC forms contained pre-printed data, including the FCC registration number, these were given to candidates on a clipboard. Each candidate took the exam in the front seat of their own vehicle. Under the circumstances, we used four ARRL VEs for the exam instead of the required three. Wheeler County Aries loaned Stuart Bottom, K7FG, to help as the third required amateur extra class volunteer examiner. Everyone dressed warmly, and most candidates had their heaters running, Fletcher reported. A camper owned by Rhonda Mettler, KB5LAX, and a communications van owned by Fletcher served as sites to check results and sign forms. The Grant County Roads Department loaned its parking area for the exam session. It will indeed be a silent night on Christmas Eve, as there will be no Christmas Eve transmission from SAQ, the Alexanderson Alternator Transmitting Station in Sweden. The Grimmerton World Heritage Foundation and Alexander GVV Friends Association cited prevailing circumstances in our society for the event cancellation. We find it sad to make this decision, but see it as a necessary measure to protect everyone involved. The announcement continued. Past SAQ transmission events are chronicled on YouTube. We truly regret this and hope for your understanding of the situation and continued support for the business. We hope that our old lady can soon be heard on the air again. The announcement concluded. The vintage Alexanderson alternator provided an electromechanical means of transmitting message traffic. It dates back to the early 1920s via spark transmission. Amateur radio on the International Space Station will continue its year-long 20th anniversary celebration of continuous ham radio operation from the ISS this month with a slow scan television event over the holidays. With more details on the upcoming event from the space station, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters. Amateur Radio on the International Space Station, ARIS, will continue its year-long 20th anniversary celebration of continuous ham radio operation from the ISS this month with a slow-scan television SSTV event over the holidays. The commemorative late December SSTV event will be held December 24th through December 31st, although those dates are subject to change. The frequency will be 145.8 MHz using SSTV PD120 mode. Over its 20 years, ARIS has supported nearly 1,400 scheduled ham radio contacts with schools, student groups, and other educational organizations. ARIS will continue to sponsor various commemorative events through November 2021, including more of the very popular ARIS SSTV sessions. The first ARIS school contact took place in December 2000, 
Not long after the first ISS crew arrived on station a month earlier and had made test contacts. The commemorative late December SSTV event will be held December 24th through December 31st, although dates are subject to change. The frequency will be 145.800 MHz using SSTV PD120 mode. Over its 20 years, ARIS has supported nearly 1,400 scheduled ham radio contacts with schools, student groups, and other education organizations. ARIS would not be the complex and growing program of education, operations, and hardware were it not for ARRL, AMSAT, NASA, and the ISS National Lab, said Rosalie White, K1STO, ARIS U.S. Delegate representing ARRL. For these past 20 years and for the years to come, when we grow into lunar ham radio opportunities and more, the ARIS team will continue to be grateful to ARRL and all our sponsors. We could not do it without you. The ARIS ham radio gear for what would become NA-1SS on board the station arrived ahead of the Expedition 1 crew headed by Bill Shepard, KD5GSL. Shepard made the first ARIS school contact with students at Luther Burbank Elementary School in Illinois on December 21, 2000. NASA has marked the ARIS milestone with an infographic highlighting the educational contacts via amateur radio between astronaut crew members aboard the ISS and students. In celebration of the 20th anniversary of ham radio on the space station, ARIS took part in the ISS Research and Development Conference panel session, 20 Years of STEM Experiments on the ISS. A video developed from the session describes the program, conveys some key lessons learned over the past 20 years, and describes the ARIS team's vision for the future. 20 years of continuous operations is a phenomenal accomplishment, said ARIS International Chair Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, who's been with the program from the start. But what makes it even more extraordinary is that ARIS has achieved this through hundreds of volunteers who are passionate in paying it forward to our youth and ham radio community. On behalf of the ARIS International team, I would like to express our heartfelt thanks to every volunteer who has made ARIS such an amazing success over the past 20 years. Your passion, drive, creativity, and spirit made it happen. In September, ARIS announced that the initial element of its next generation interoperable radio system had been installed in the ISS Columbus module, replacing outmoded and problematic station gear. A helpful addition to the ARIS website is the current status of ISS stations, which reports the present or coming operating mode of ARIS radios in the Columbus and Service modules. Click on General Contacts and then Current Status of ISS Stations on the drop-down menu of the ARIS website to access the reports. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a direct download on our website at www.twiar.net. An interesting window now on the shadowy world of military goings-on in Russia. Well, someone has helped themselves to the very latest communications equipment from a top-secret plane. I wonder if they're busy scratching the serial numbers off. Thieves have stolen electronic equipment from a Russian military aircraft known as the Doomsday Plane for its role in the country's nuclear arsenal. Reports say that unknown thieves broke into the Ilushin IL-80 plane at an airfield in the southern region of Rostov. It's unclear where the incident took place, but 39 units of equipment and five radio boards were taken. The local government said that an investigation was underway. Military experts say that the aircraft is one of four IL-80s designed to be used as airborne command posts for Russian officials, including President Putin, in the event of a nuclear conflict. The Interfax News Agency describes them as amongst Russia's most classified aircraft. Further details have not been publicly disclosed about the equipment taken by the thieves. Here's the current schedule for upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars. 
Visit the ARRL Learning Network webpage to register, check out upcoming webinars, and view previously recorded sessions. The following schedule is subject to change. QSLing in an Online World, hosted by Anthony Lucher, K8ZT. Learn all about the changing methods of QSLing in amateur radio, including traditional paper QSL cards and electronic QSLing methods such as Logbook of the World and eQSL. This webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, January 5th, 2021 at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, or 1800 UTC. Amateur Radio Logging, hosted by Anthony Lucier, K8ZT. Discover the advantages of keeping an electronic amateur radio log. Find out why you may need more than one software program for logging contesting, digital modes, special events, and more. Learn about using one full-featured logging program to pull everything together, interface with outside databases, handle electronic QSLing, and so on. The discussion will include file formats, importing and exporting data between programs, submitting contest logs online, and safe backups of data. This webinar is scheduled for Thursday, January 7th, 2021 at 12.30 p.m. Pacific, 3.30 p.m. Eastern, or 2030 UTC. VHF UHF Contesting and Summits on the Air, a perfect match. This webinar is hosted by Brian Betts, W7JET. Explore the challenge of VHF UHF contesting and the success of the large scale participation of Summits on the Air. Summits on the Air Summit activators will be on the air in Arizona for their January VHF contest. This webinar is scheduled for Thursday, January 14th, 2021 at 12.30 p.m. Pacific, 3.30 p.m. Eastern, or 2030 UTC. Emergency Communications, why train? North Texas Section Emergency Coordinator, hosted by Greg Evans, K5, GTX. Why should we train? Utilizing amateur radio operators in an emergency communication situation is a key function that can save lives. We must be able to respond to the needs of our served agencies quickly and responsibly. Topics covered include incident command system and its relevance, building on consistent training, interoperability with multiple communications providers, interoperability with VOAD and partners, and mission one, get the information delivered. This webinar is scheduled for Thursday, January 21st, 2021 at 12.30 p.m. Pacific, 3.30 p.m. Eastern, or 2030 UTC. During the third quarter of 2020, ARRL Volunteer Monitor Program volunteers spent more than 6,100 hours pouring over the amateur bands. The Volunteer Monitor Program issued 15 good operator letters. Volunteers are in the chair monitoring, recognizing exemplary operators and admonishing those who need to pay closer attention to their operating practices, said Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, the Volunteer Monitor Program Coordinator. The Volunteer Monitor Program referred two cases to the FCC while accepting two cases from the FCC for investigation. Developed in partnership with the FCC, the Volunteer Monitor Program routinely maintains contact with the FCC and took part in three meetings during the third quarter with FCC Enforcement Bureau personnel. As he has done each December for the past few years, Brian Justin, WA1ZMS of Forest, Virginia, will transmit a program on 486 kilohertz under authority of his FCC Part 5 Experimental License WI2XLQ to commemorate wireless pioneer Reginald Fezenden's accomplishments. Justin will transmit for at least 24 hours, starting at around 1800 UTC on December 24th. Fezenden claimed to have made his first voice and music broadcast on Christmas Eve in 1906 from Brant Rock, Massachusetts, although his account is disputed. There's a new report that's a little ominous from a U.S. agency that believes RF transmissions may have contributed to the illness of numerous government employees overseas. A report commissioned by the U.S. State Department has concluded that radio frequency transmissions, including microwaves, may have been responsible for neurological symptoms in American spies and diplomats abroad in the past several years. The National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine called the headaches, dizziness, and other ailments the result of so-called sonic attacks in its report published this month. The findings by experts in medicine and related fields attempts to explain what came to be known as Havana Syndrome, suffered by employees of the U.S. government at the U.S. Embassy in Havana in late 2016. 
U.S. workers assigned to China, Russia, and elsewhere also suffered similar symptoms. The report did not conclude, however, that the microwaves were transmitted to cause deliberate harm, but noted that such transmissions could indeed be used for those purposes. A number of activities are taking place despite the continued global pandemic. With barely a month to go, Winter Field Day organizers are getting ready for the big event with allowances for COVID-19 precautions. The need for emergency preparedness doesn't drop when the temperatures do, so organizers of the Winter Field Day event are putting the final details in place for the next activations on the final weekend of January 2021. They have posted the official rules noting that there are no basic changes from last year's exercise, with the exception that COVID-19 rules are going to be in effect for clubs and groups. As always, modes that can transmit the exchange without a conversion table are being allowed. For this reason, FT8 and FT4 are excluded. Allowable modes include CW, SSB, AM, FM, D-Star, C4FM, DMR, Satellite, and others that are posted on the Winter Field Day website. Remote station operation is also permitted. Club members operating as a group but not congregating on one site for the activation are advised to check the rules on the website to ensure their scoring methods comply with the rules to simplify the tallying of points. For more details, visit winterfieldday.com. Winter Field Day, which began in 2007, is taking place on January 30th and 31st. Another popular winter event, Ham Radio University, has opened registration to all its forms taking place on January 9th, 2021. Ham Radio University will not be held in its usual location on Long Island, but is going forward as a virtual event through GoToWebinar. This means, of course, you don't have to be in New York to attend this annual day-long amateur radio convention. If you are interested in attending, you need to register individually for each of the forums you wish to attend. Each forum's attendance is capped at 500 participants. Details are available at the website hamradiouniversity.org slash forums. That's hamradiouniversity, one word, dot org slash forums. Meanwhile, Contest University, which was held as a virtual event in May, has a free virtual propagation summit planned for the 23rd of January. It's being held as a Zoom webinar and runs from 1600 UTC to 2000 UTC, covering such subjects as HF ionospheric propagation, predictions for solar cycle 25, maximizing antenna performance with irregular terrain, and an update on HAMSI activities for the year ahead. To register, visit ContestUniversity.com. You're listening to America's premier amateur radio news magazine of the air. This week in amateur radio. CW Ops is now accepting nominations for its 2021 award for advancing the art of CW. The award recognizes individuals, groups, or organizations that have made the greatest contributions towards advancing the art or practice of radio communication by Morse code. Candidates for the award may be authors of publications related to CW, CW recruiters, trainers, mentors, coaches, and instructors, public advocates of CW, organizers of CW activities, designers and inventors who advance the art or practice of CW, and other contributors to the art and practice of Morse code. The award is not limited to amateur radio operators or their organizations. Nominations can be submitted via email copying the CW Ops Secretary. Nominations must be received by March 18, 2021. It should include the names and call signs, if applicable, of nominees, and complete contact information. A detailed explanation supporting the nomination should be included along with the name, telephone number, email address, and call sign of the person submitting the nomination. An award presentation is scheduled to take place at the 2021 Dayton Hamvention.
Due to the coronavirus pandemic in Germany, the German regulator, the Federal Network Agency, or BNETSA, has announced that all amateur radio exams will be cancelled until mid-January at the earliest. This information comes to us from DARC, the German National Amateur Radio Club. The Federal Network Agency reports on its website that due to current developments in connection with the dynamic spread of the coronavirus, there will be no more amateur radio exams until mid-January 2021. Examination dates after January 20th, 2021 are initially subject to change. And furthermore, the Federal Network Agency asks German radio amateurs to refrain from registering for exams and only submit applications for admission to an amateur radio exam when new exam places have been published. The Federal Network Agency will inform everyone about this in due course. Perhaps a word of explanation. In the UK, amateur radio exams are run by radio amateurs themselves and people can take the exam online from their own home. The situation in Germany is different. There, the exams are run by the Federal Network Agency and have to be taken in person in a limited number of exam centres. Their system prevents many people from taking the exam due to travel issues and during a pandemic, well, there may be no exams at all, as we've heard. Recent changes by the New Zealand regulators to get to the general user radio licence now permit the use of an increased number of unlicensed, low-power wireless devices across frequencies that include the HF spectrum. The changes permit the use of wireless microphones and radio frequency identification transmitters in the gigahertz band and radio spectrum management is now allowing frequencies starting with the AM medium wave band right up to 10 meters to be used for other low-power purposes such as wireless charging devices. The devices must be used in a manner that does not cause interference to licensed radio services such as military, broadcast, or amateur radio. If that happens, the user must stop using the device. The general user radio license requires the use of equipment that complies with radio standards and the technical parameters of the license and mandates that each device carry a label saying it is RSM approved. Meanwhile, a new edition of the International Amateur Radio Union's VHF Handbook has recently been published and is downloadable as a PDF. This is version 9 of the handbook and it is based on the actions taken at the 2020 IARU Region 1 Virtual General Conference. It contains all the decisions made regarding the bans at VHF and higher. The handbook's ban plan also shows changes made to 436 to 438 MHz and covers 145 MHz satellite allocations. The 2021 ARRL RIDI Roundup on January 2nd and 3rd will feature two new multi-operator categories, Multi-2, M2, and Multi-Multi-MM. Because M2 and MM are new categories, there are no existing records, so the high scores for these categories will be by default become the new records. High scores are kept by U.S. Call Area, ARRL Division, ARRL Section, Canadian Province, and DX Entity. Visit the ARRL contest webpage to see the current ARRL RIDI Roundup all-time records. If you're new to RIDI or digital modes, in the RIDI Roundup operators worldwide contact and exchange QSO information with other amateurs using Bordeaux, RIDI, PSK, FT8, FT4, ASCII, Amtor, and Packet. Automated operation is not permitted. Each claim contact must include contemporaneous direct initiation by the operator on both sides of the contact. If you have a look outside your immediate household for M2 or MM operators, and you're already set up for RIDI or FT8 to FT4, consider staying safe and letting other team members access your station remotely via any desk or any sharing technology. The key to making this easy, frustration-free for all involved is that all aspects of your station's operation be controllable from your logging computer's desktop, and that the RIDI audio be audible to the remote operator if using RIDI via the sharing software. It is possible to do RIDI without listening to the receiver and just by watching the decode of the, and the XY or waterfall, but it's not recommended. Many, if not most, RIDI operators prefer low-level audio to signal when other stations are transmitting. For those using FTX modes, all you really need is a screen display. 
Contacts must be made on 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meters. Any station may work any other station. Stations may be worked once per band, regardless of mode. The ARRL Ready Roundup begins at 1800 UTC on January 2nd and wraps up 2359 UTC on January 3rd. The third edition of Storm Spotting and Amateur Radio is now available from ARRL. Storm Spotting gives radio amateurs another way to offer public service by using their skills as communicators. In an average year, the U.S. experiences more than 10,000 severe thunderstorms, 5,000 floods, and more than 1,000 tornadoes. During these weather events, ham radio volunteers provide real-time information to partners such as emergency managers and National Weather Service forecasters. New in this edition are lessons learned and response reports from the 2017 hurricane season, among other things. Co-authors are University of Mississippi Professor of Emergency Management Michael Corey, KI1U, and former Emory Riddle Aeronautical University Meteorology Professor Victor Morris, AH6WX, with contributing editor Rob Macedo, KD1CY. Written to bridge the gap between basic theory and graduate-level engineering texts, the second edition of Antenna Physics, an introduction, includes new material to help you better understand the complexities of antenna theory. World-recognized antenna technology authority Robert J. Zavril, Jr., W7SX is your guide to grasping a deeper understanding of how antenna systems function. In this book, he clearly communicates the theory and the mathematics that form the foundations upon which all antenna designs depend. The 5 MHz newsletter has been around since radio amateurs in the UK were first given access to spot frequencies in the 60 meter band. Over the years, it has proved to be a focal point for everything about ham radio on the band, not only in the UK, but on a worldwide scale. Here's how to track it down. The latest edition of the 5 MHz newsletter is now available for a free PDF download. It's number 25, the Summer Autumn Edition 2020. The newsletter is edited by Paul G4 Mike Whiskey Oscar. This edition includes 5 MHz news from four countries, the latest World of 5 MHz map, the G4 UDU 6060 antenna, an article about G5 Mike Hotel Zulu, that's G5 MHz, it's called Remembering Gordon Adams, G3 LEQ, and the new Croatian QRP 60 meter beacon, 9 Alpha 5, Alpha Delta India, Stroke Bravo. You can download the latest newsletter via the RSGB's 5 MHz page. Go to rsgb.org and follow the links to the HF Band Plan's 5 MHz page. This page also contains a large amount of useful information for anyone thinking about operating on the 5 MHz band. You are listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Coming up, how to turn off those annoying site notifications in Google Chrome. Stay tuned. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. This is a, a tool tip, a helping hint, and presumably this showed up when you went to Chrome or, uh, Google com. I don't know if you can disable this or if this is one of those things that's grandfathered in by Google. I have to say, I don't see them, so I'm thinking maybe you can. And let me show you where they hide this feature because honestly, it drives me nuts. We've all seen this nowadays. You go to a site, you haven't been there before, and it says, hey, hey, would you like us to notify you? Hey, when anything exciting happens on the site, they all want to do this. And what they want to do is pop up notifications in your browser when you're visiting. Now, Google does not make this easy to disable. They do not make it easy to find, but it is in your Chrome settings. So let's go there right now. And uh, we, we have a lot of settings. And the problem is, it's not kind of not where you would expect it to be. It's under site settings. I'm not sure if this will fix those Google pop-ups, but if there is a way to do it, this will be how you do it. Now it's showing me a number of sites that I have already allowed, including from my Google Calendar. You might want pop-ups from your Google Calendar. I definitely don't want GoPro to pop up notifications. So that's a no-go. And here's the settings site-wide for GoPro, but I was just gonna clear all of that out. 
And then I'm going to do something that's going to change my life and your life. Sprint, why did I? Oh, I see. I'm just blocking location from Sprint. Again, I might want to turn that back on. So I'm just going to clear the data or and reset the permissions. And now the next time I go to Sprint, it'll say, hey, can I have location information? But here's the thing that uh, you want to look at. These are all the permissions. Uh, this is actually an important thing. You notice it's kind of hidden away under site settings in the settings it's under the privacy and security tab location camera and most of these should be asked before accessing you should change them this is the one that i change and i think you want to change notifications ask before sending uh, you might just say well yeah of course ask but that's that's the problem every site you go to says hey can i send you notifications here's what you do flip this switch to off say sites cannot ask to send notifications and furthermore if you have sites that you've given permission as you can see i have probably by accident just remove them just remove them you have to do it one by one unfortunately but this way not only will sites no longer send you notifications but they won't ask you if they can send notifications now notice there are some places here where notifications are allowed and these are all generally from google and this is a little bit more troubling you can reset the permissions here including the notifications now you see i have them blocked but you might want to go through all of the ones that you've these that you've allowed and i suspect somewhere you've allowed uh, google look at that there's that gopro again let's let's go into settings here and just block them forever <laughs> isn't that a good feeling I do want my calendar notifications to come up, but I don't need notifications from Google Drive. Mail? Yeah, I don't use Gmail anymore. Notice there's no way to turn this off. And that's part of the problem. That little helpful pop-up that you might, you've might you been getting, that might actually be something Google does not let you turn off because, hey, we want to be able to advertise to you. It is well worth whatever browser you use. I don't actually use Google Chrome very often. It is the most used browser. On uh, Apple's uh, Macintosh, especially on the new Macs, I use the Safari browser. Uh, everywhere else, I use Firefox. I like Firefox a lot. It's it's the last real open source browser, so yeah, I, I like that a lot about them. In every case, though, these browsers do allow you somewhere buried in the settings, usually under site settings, to disable notifications and pop-ups like that. The problem with using Google Chrome is, and Google's never shy about this, Google will use Google Chrome to promote their commercial activities. You're using a free Google piece of software, and the deal, unwritten, unspoken, is, and yes, we're going to do what we want with that browser. So ultimately, the best way to dismiss those notifications is to stop using Google Chrome. I know many businesses require it. I uh, always keep a copy of Chrome on my system because occasionally I'll get to a site that says, oh, no, you have to use Chrome. But increasingly, Microsoft's Edge, which is based on the same engine as Google Chrome, the Chromium engine, works just as well on those sites. It, it has other privacy issues, but not any Google privacy issues. Firefox has a lot of settings. In fact, Firefox probably has the most elaborate privacy settings that really allow you to block a lot of things, including those Facebook like buttons, things like that. Brave, which is a privacy-centered browser that's based on also on the Chromium engine, has a lot of privacy settings. So does Opera. I would say it's a good idea to try a bunch of different browsers. It seems like Chrome is now just the default for everybody. I would look at the platform native browsers, Safari on Mac OS, Edge on Microsoft Windows. I think in most cases, those should be your go-to. The reason I use Firefox is because I can synchronize Firefox bookmarks and plugins, you know, extensions across all the different platforms I use, Windows, Mac, and Linux. And I do use a lot of different systems because of my job. So for me, Firefox makes the most sense because of Firefox Sync. Try them all. See which ones you like. And I can promise you, you're not going to get those annoying Google pop-ups on anything that's not a Google browser so often as users of technology we kind of we put up with the little aggravations we go oh, yeah, it's too much trouble to figure it out and it's annoying but i'll just close that box and i'm going to live with it the problem is i believe over time they add up and add up and, and and they really become detrimental to your experience of using a system so i like the idea of when something annoys you fix it it usually doesn't take very long maybe a, a little research a question an email to me but fix it because 
Each one of those, it's death by a thousand paper cuts. Each one of those is whittling away the pleasant user experience and making it, you know, unpleasant. And pretty soon they pile up and pretty soon it's just no fun anymore. So fix it. That's my, it's the broken windows policing of computer technology. <laughs> if you know what that means. Uh, let's see, what else can we talk about? Last week we talked about Sidewalk which is Amazon's uh, interesting, and I don't think necessarily nefarious, plan to create a low speed, they actually call it low ra, long range, low speed network all over town. If you have an Amazon device, Sidewalk is on by default. Everything except the very first generation Amazon Echoes. So your Echoes, your, uh, your doorbells, ring doorbells or ring cameras anything like that that's got a uh, that's got a chip in it it must have been planning this because even the second generation echoes have this so it must have been, it must have been planning this for a while but they uh, they have this chip that will borrow a little bit just a little bit just borrow a tiny teeny weeny bit of your <laughs> your internet and uh, and spread it around the neighborhood to create a what they call a mesh network and you know, the, initially they proposed with sidewalks some, I think, kind of sort of useful things. For instance, if you and your neighbors and everybody have Amazon devices, and by the way, again, this is on by default. You have to turn it off. I would say leave it on. Uh, having, you know, my security guy, Steve Gibson, we do a security podcast uh, called Security Now. He looked at all the inside technical details. He said, yeah, it's private. It's safe. It's secure. It's not opening any back doors. And it's using a tiny bit of bandwidth. And by the way... In a way, you get that back because it also uses a tiny bit of your neighbor's bandwidth and their bandwidth. And so you can get, I guess, someday, they're not selling it yet, a little dog tag, for instance, that will uh, will spot Fido wherever he is in the neighborhood because there's this little kind of network that Fido's tag is connecting to as he wanders around. Not, you know, because after he leaves, you know, more than 100 feet away from your house, you, you can't see him with your Wi-Fi, but the neighbor's Wi-Fi can. It's not even the neighbor's Wi-Fi. The neighbor's Amazon devices can. They're selling a little mailbox sensor. If you have a one of those rural route mailboxes that are, you know, not in the door of your front door, but but in in you know out in front of the house or down the road, down the driveway, whatever, you put a little sensor in there. It happens to have a little repeater, so it can spread the sidewalk network. So they they would like you to put that down at the end of the driveway, right? But it also lets you know when the mail comes. Like Lurch. Mail's in. And a lot of people very uh, upset about this. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago, I think, or last week. Just the notion of Amazon just saying, look, we're going to borrow some of your internet. But it's a tiny amount. They say never more than 500 megabytes a month and probably a lot less than that. And again, if you use it, you'll be borrowing the neighbors too. So you, get, you can kind of get it back. I think in the long run, maybe this is about for Amazon... I don't know. I was I was going to say spotting their delivery vehicles, but I'm sure they have trackers in all of those. UPS does, FedEx does. They know. You've, you've gotten the text. I love this. Is it from FedEx? Your package is nine stops away. Now it's eight stops away. I love that. But they know that because there's trackers in the vehicles. So I don't think it's that. Maybe there'll be trackers on the packages. That'd be kind of interesting. If you're what I have, we have a guy who works for us has had half a dozen packages stolen this month from his, you know, apartment complex because they leave them out by the mailbox and somebody says, oh, look, <laughs> Amazon stuff and takes it. Well, if, if, this, if this sidewalk network, Amazon's network, were turned on, you'd know where your package was. Then Amazon is selling now something that I actually got and I was wearing for a while, now I'm not sure, called the Halo Band. It's a $65 uh, smart band. Band. It's not, I wouldn't want to say a smart watch because there's no face on it. You can't tell the time with it. It's just like a Velcro thing, sorry, hook and loop thing you put around your wrist. And, and the, the, the goods, the works are inside, you know, not outside your wrist, but inside there's a bump on your wrist that tells you things like your, you know, the normal things, heart rate and how far you've walked. But it also does two things <laughs> that uh, are a little questionable. One, it has a microphone, and you have to turn this on. It's not on by default. That listens to your tone of voice. You can press a button and say, remember what I was doing at that conversation. 
or just no, you know, you can monitor yourself all day, and I'll say you sounded a little angry, or you sounded happy most of the day. You were a little down about two p.m. I left it on for a few days. It was kind of interesting. I think fairly accurate. You know, I was doing shows, doing podcasts, so a lot of the times it's, you sound hopeful, you sound interested, <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, not once in the three days did I yell at anybody. That's good. But if you, you know, if you had a tendency to lose your temper, this would be, I guess, kind of cool. The other thing they ask you to do, and I did not do this, is strip down, yes, to your skivvies and take photos of yourself so they can estimate your body fat percentage. And then you would do that over a period of time. <laughs> Senator Amy Klobuchar sent a, a letter to Amazon saying, actually, she sent it to the Health and Human Services Secretary asking uh, Alex Azar, what, what are you doing to make sure that that information is protected. Klobuchar said, I think this is even more intrusive than many of these products, and I had already been concerned. This one takes it to the nth degree. Well, true. It's bold of Amazon at this time of extra introspection or inspection or investigation by the federal government to put something like this out. But remember, you buy it, you turn it on, you say, okay. So it's up to you. Amazon says we don't send voice recorders to our servers. We send the recorders to the recordings to your phone, and that's where they're analyzed. So they're safe. Same thing with the pictures. So you're safe. Well, no, actually, they delete the recordings, but the body fat photos are sent to the Amazon cloud for processing, then deleted. Amazon says I'm not. We're not going to sell the data, or even share it, or even target you with sales pitches. You look a little fat. <laughs> you need a girdle. <laughs> that would be embarrassing. It's interesting. Interesting. I don't know. It doesn't bother me. Amazon's letting you opt in. Sidewalk, assuming it's secure and private, and it seems to be, would you turn it off? If you have an Amazon, you need the Amazon Echo app. It's, called, it's the A-word app. I don't like to say that out loud. I don't want to trigger anybody or anybody's device, I guess I should say. It's the A-L-E-X-A app. You know what I'm talking about? And if you go in into it in the A-L-E-X-A app, and uh, you look at, you go to your settings, you'll see in the settings that there is, let's see, a settings, account, I guess you go to your account of settings, and then there's a thing called Amazon Sidewalk. So they, yeah, they bury it a little bit. So, well, let's account settings, let's, let's go back up. How many clicks is this? So, <laughs> here's the A Word app, let's see. Then you go to settings, okay. Then you go to account settings. Why? I guess that's something separate. And then recognized voices, guest connect, voice purchasing. Ah, Amazon Sidewalk. Coming soon. And they describe it all. And then you can turn it off. It says enabled. And then there's also community finding, which is a separate thing. Coming soon. Help find things with Sidewalk. See, there have been devices like the tracker and the tile who that use Bluetooth and they were kind of like that. If you have a tile on your keys and somebody who has the tile app on their phone walks by your keys, the tile app on their phone says, oh, I see Leo's keys and sends a note back to tile. Tile knows, oh, that's ID number 439222445. That's Leo. They send you a message saying your keys were seen on the sidewalk. But this is much better because, I mean, from the point of view of, of finding your keys anyway. What do you think? Would you, uh, would you, would you turn that off or, now that you know how? Or will you leave it on? I'm going to leave it on. I have a lot of Echo devices in the house. So I'm going to leave it on. Anyway, I'm glad you were here. And I'm here. And I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY. And I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. Here on This Week in amateur radio. The Radio Act of 1912 was hopelessly obsolete by the early 1920s. Conceived in an era of long and medium wave spark telegraphy, the act was totally inadequate when it came to broadcasting and the short waves. The Department of Commerce gamely tried to stretch the act to meet the new requirements. The 1922 and 1924 regulations that banned broadcasting by amateurs set up the broadcast band and carved out the 160, 80, 40, 20, and 5 meter bands were really nothing more than gentlemen's agreements, valid as long as they weren't challenged. For a time they worked. Amateurs enthusiastically settled in on their new bands and began working the world 
while the number of broadcasters in the new 550 to 1500 kilocycle region jumped from 30 to almost 600 in just three years. Technical advances had not kept up with this growth, however, and there were problems. Crystal control of transmitters was still a couple of years away, and the unstable broadcasting stations drifted from their assigned frequencies, sometimes to the point of interfering with adjacent channels. Even stations off frequency by 400 to 600 cycles could cause ear-splitting heterodynes. Most receivers of the 1920s were either regenerative or TRF, tuned radio frequency, which were good on sensitivity and poor on selectivity. As a result, the 1920s broadcast band was saturated with only 600 stations. Compare that to today's medium wave where tight frequency control of 20 cycles coupled with directional antennas and selective superheterodyne receivers allows over 4,000 stations to occupy the AM broadcast band without undue interference. The Department of Commerce therefore issued regulations mandating such solutions as time sharing, where two or more stations occupied the same frequency at different times of the day, and daytime only operations. Stations were constantly moved to another frequency or told to decrease power in order to minimize interference. The department also went after stations whose transmitters drifted onto adjacent channels. An interesting example of this was the Los Angeles station of sister Amy Semple McPherson, an evangelist who was the leader of the International Church of the Four Square Gospel. Her station was notorious for drifting up and down the broadcast band. When the federal radio inspectors tried to keep her on frequency, she imperiously wrote to Secretary Hoover, demanding that his minions of Satan stay away from her transmitter. The Almighty would choose her wavelength, she wrote, not the Department of Commerce. Many of the stations that had been told to move, told to reduce power, or share their frequency did what any patriotic American would do, hire a lawyer. Once the legal bloodhounds began digging, certain things came to light. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution allows the federal government to regulate interstate commerce. Furthermore, it is an accepted fact that a federal agency cannot issue any regulations unless it was given the power to do so by Congress. Thus, the lawyers for the disgruntled stations challenged the Secretary's regulations on two fronts. First, that the Radio Act of 1912 gave the Department no authority to regulate broadcasting stations, and second, that since many stations could not be heard across state lines, there was no interstate commerce, and therefore no federal jurisdiction. This is the argument used by Radio Free Berkeley and other low-power pirate stations. The Day of Reckoning arrived in 1926 when an Illinois district court held that there was no federal law to permit the Secretary of Commerce to assign broadcasting licenses or frequencies. The Attorney General admitted that the federal government had no control over radio except what was specifically authorized in the 1912 Act. Pandemonium broke out. Stations, liberated from all federal control, upped their power, jumped frequency, and or began full-time operations on daytime or share time frequencies. Smaller stations were jammed off the air. Unlicensed transmitters appeared out of nowhere, dropped down on any convenient or inconvenient frequency, and began broadcasting. Anarchy was king. Amateurs, of course, could have legally joined in this RF orgy. There was nothing preventing them from getting back to broadcasting, moving to new frequencies, exceeding the one kilowatt limit, or anything else they desired. To their credit, they did nothing of the sort. One reason was the immense respect they felt for Secretary Hoover, a man who over and over publicly supported amateur radio in any way possible. They would abide by their gentleman's agreement with him. The other reason was common sense. They knew that Congress would soon rectify the problem by passing appropriate legislation. The broadcasters were big boys with a lot of money, powerful corporate backers, and six million listeners. They could afford to violate the spirit of the law and get away with it. Amateurs did not have this luxury. They realized that any violations of the 1922 and 1924 agreements, even if they were legally unenforceable, would cost them dearly in political support. So while the 550 to 1500 kilocycle segment was a free-for-all, the amateur bands were disciplined and orderly as hams mastered the art of crystal control and improved their operating skills. 
Incidentally, one area where these skills were honed was expeditions. From the Arctic to the Antarctic, from Macmillan to Byrd, amateurs provided the necessary communications of almost every major explorer. Also, in the area of emergencies, amateurs provided communications during snow and ice storms, hurricanes, earthquakes, and floods. The federal government quickly moved to end the chaotic mess on the broadcast band. The Radio Act of 1927 was approved on February 23rd. This law defined amateur radio for the first time in a federal statute and created the Federal Radio Commission, which was given the power to classify and regulate all aspects of all radio stations for the public interest, convenience, or necessity. Criminal penalties were written into the 1927 Act for violations of the Act or any regulation thereunder. The Commission immediately went to work. Minions of Satan got Sister Amy's station back on frequency and shut down the transmitter of KFKB, the station of Dr. John Brinkley, graduate of the Eclectic Medical School and proponent of prostate operations and, get this, goat gland transplants to cure all medical ills. Patients by the thousands listened to KFKB's broadcasts and flocked to Kansas to have the operations, picking out their goat from the pens next to the hospital as they went in. Do you think I could make this up? Unfortunately, after the commission shut him down, Dr. Brinkley went to Mexico by the Texas border, set up a 150,000 watt station, and continued his fraudulent operations. In regards to amateur radio, the commission, in effect, kept the status quo for the 15,000 hams. All agreements and regulations enacted by the Department of Commerce were maintained and incorporated into current regulations. The only change that hams noticed was the addition of a prefix on their calls. Thus, 1AW became W1AW, 1JS became W1JS, etc. However, the existence of a sympathetic commission and friendly regulations wasn't enough. Radio was truly international and, as a result, an international radio telegraph conference was scheduled in Washington, D.C. for October 4, 1927. Word was filtering out of Europe and the Far East that many governments were anti-amateur radio. How would our hobby fare at this conference? Join us the next time as the Ancient Amateur Archives has the answers. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. Foundations of Amateur Radio One of the many vexing issues associated with getting on air and making noise is actually making that happen. So, let's look at a completely restricted environment. An apartment building, seven stories off the ground, no ability to make holes, an unsympathetic council, restrictive local homeowners association, etc, etc. On the face of it, your amateur radio hobby is doomed from the start. In reality, it's only just beginning. So, to hear HF right now, today, you can go online and listen to a plethora of web-based software-defined radios. There's the canonical WebSDR Inventor, and a whole host of others using the same or similar software. There's QESDR, AirSpy, Global Tuners, and many more. This will give you countless radios to play with, coverage across the globe, the ability to compare signals from different receivers at the same time on the same frequency, the ability to decode digital modes, find propagation, learn about how contests are done, the sky's the limit. I'll add that you don't need an amateur license for many of these resources. So, if you're considering becoming part of the community of radio amateurs, this is a great way to dip your toe in the water. Think of it as a shortwave listening experience on steroids. I hear you say, but that's not amateur radio. To that I say, actually, it is. It's everything except a physical antenna at your shack or the ability to transmit. Permit me a digression to the higher bands. If you want to listen to local repeaters on UHF and VHF, listen to DMR and Brandmaster, you'll find plenty of online resources as well. You can often use a handheld radio to connect to a local repeater, which can get you onto the global Echolink, IRLP and All-Star networks. Failing that, there's phone apps to make that connection instead. Of course, if you want to expand your repertoire to transmission beyond a handheld, you can. There are online transmitters as well. Many clubs have their club station available for amateurs to use remotely using a tool like Remote Hams. You'll get access to a radio that's able to transmit, and you'll be able to make contacts, even do digital modes and contests. You will require an amateur license and access to such a station. 
Some clubs will require that you pay towards the running of such a service, and often you'll need to be a member. Then there's actually going to the club, you know, physically, going to the club shack and twiddling physical knobs. Though for plenty of clubs, that's now also a computer, since they're adopting software-defined radios, just like the rest of the community is. Using a radio via a computer can be achieved directly in the shack, but there's no reason to stay on site. You can often use these radios from the comfort of your own shack. If you do want to get physical with your own gear, receiving is pretty simple. A radio with a wire attached to it will get you listening to the local environment. I have, for example, a Raspberry Pi connected to an RTL SDR dongle that's connected to a wire antenna in my shack. It's listening across the bands 24-7 and reporting on what it hears. If you want to use an actual transceiver and you don't have the ability to set up an antenna, kit out your car and go mobile. Failing that, make a go kit with batteries, which as an aside will stand you in good stead during an emergency. Take your go kit camping or climbing or hiking. Plenty of opportunities to get on air and make noise. I hear you asking what about having an antenna farm? Well, you can set one up in a farmer's paddock and connect to it remotely. You will need permission from the landowner. There's plenty of amateurs who use their country abode as a remote station. If you want to make noise at your actual shack, the antenna might be a piece of wire hanging from the balcony after dark, or an antenna clamped to the railing. You can use a magnetic loop inside your house. Some enterprising amateurs have tuned up the gutters in their building, or made a flagpole vertical, or laid a coax antenna on the roof. Have a look for stealth antennas, there's a hundred years of amateurs facing the same problem. My own station is very minimalist. There's literally a vertical antenna clamped to the steel patio. Using that, I'm working the world with 5 watts, 14,000 kilometers on 10 meters, no kidding. Getting on air and making noise doesn't have to start and finish with a Yagi on a tower. There's plenty of other opportunities to be an active amateur. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. With the propagation forecast for Friday, December 18th, this is W2XBS. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that solar activity has declined with the weekly average daily sunspot number slipping from 57.6 during the last reporting week to 17.4 over the past week. Solar flux averages also slipped over the past two weeks from 108.1 to 91.9 and all the way down to 82.1 over the most recent week. The latest solar flux prediction also appears soft. Solar flux is expected to peak at 86 on December 26th to the 28th and hit a low of 82 on January 1st through the 10th and then peak again back up at 86 from January 21st to the 24th. Predicted values over the next 45 days are 82 on December 18th to the 24th, 83 on December 25th, 86 on December 26th to the 28th, 85, 84, and 83 on December 29th to the 31st, 82 on January 1st to January 10th, 83, 83, and 84 on January 11th to the 13th, 85 on January 14th to the 20th. The predicted planetary A in DICE is 5 on December 18th to the 20th, 12 on December 21st, 8 on December 22nd to the 25th, 5 on December 26th to January 4th, and 10 on January 5th and 6th. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, and here's the AMSAT report from Bruce Page, KK5DO. AMSAT says it's had good fortune this year with many ham satellites launched and successfully placed into orbit and operation. To those who have spent time building and having payloads deployed, congratulations on a job well done. More developments are ahead to bring a satellite into high Earth orbit again. The next generation of AMSAT satellites, GOLF, or Greater Orbit Larger Footprint, is in development. The first satellite in the series is Golf T, which is planned to launch no earlier than 2022. Following that will be Golf 1, which is planned to launch no earlier than fourth quarter of 2022. Go to the amsat.org website for more information. And remember, AMSAT is always looking for talented volunteers. Click on Get Involved and Volunteer for AMSAT. The AMSAT report is compliments of Bruce Page, KK5DO, who extends happy holiday wishes on behalf of the AMSAT Board of Directors.
Another hugely successful initiative in the world of amateur radio is YOTA, the Youngsters on the Air program. Few can have missed the special call signs being activated all over the world on an almost continuous basis, and the obvious enthusiasm is a pleasure to hear. Over in the Republic of Ireland, the youngsters on the air call sign Echo India Zero Yankee Oscar Tango Alpha has been activated a number of times since the start of December. Special thanks go to 8-year-old Ryan, Echo India 8 Kilo Whiskey, 11-year-old Siobhan, the daughter of Adrian, Echo India 9 Hotel Alpha Bravo, and Slav, Echo India 6 Kilo Whiskey and his daughter, who have taken the time to operate the Echo India Zero Yankee Oscar Tango Alpha call sign. And between them, they've achieved over a thousand contacts so far. If anyone else would like to take the time to activate the call sign this December and share the hobby with a young relative or a friend, please contact the Irish Radio Transmitters Society Youth Officer, Neil, Echo India 6 Hotel India Bravo. You can reach him by email ei6hib at hotmail.com. 43 stations with the Yota suffix are now listed on the Yota website at events.ham-yota.com. By working these Yota stations during December, you can qualify for an award that's available in four categories, bronze, silver, gold and platinum. Check the Yota website for details. That URL again, events.ham-yota.com. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartMedia and Spotify. Finland lost the important 1240 to 1300 megahertz amateur radio band on April 24, 2020. National Society SRAL now asking for 220 to 225 megahertz as a replacement. Their initial request for 902 to 928 megahertz having been rejected. The request is to provide spectrum for amateur television operation. It seems that currently operation in 1240 to 1300 MHz is still possible, but only by applying for a special permit. These special permits will cease when the Galileo GNSS constellation becomes fully operational. A translation of a DARC post reads, On April 24, 2020, new frequency allocation regulations came into force in Finland. The 23 centimeter band, 1240 to 1300 MHz, has not been an amateur radio band in Finland since then. The 23 centimeter area may only be used with a special permit, which can be granted for a limited period as long as the Galileo system is not yet fully operational. Due to the loss of the 23 centimeter band in Finland, the essential possibilities of amateur radio television are eliminated. The Finnish Amateur Radio Association, SRAL, is now proposing the use of the 220 to 225 MHz subrange by the Amateur Radio Service as a replacement. On the other hand, the Finnish Telecommunications Administration has meanwhile asked the broadcasting services to register frequency requirements for the broadcast frequency range 470 to 960 megahertz. Thereupon, the Finnish Amateur Radio Association proposed to the authority to allow an output frequency for ATV in a broadcast status in this frequency range namely in the range 902 to 928 MHz, which may already be used in Region 2 by the Amateur Radio Service. The associated input frequency could be in a different frequency range, for example 2.4 GHz. However, the Telecommunications Authority announced that it did not see the transmission of an amateur radio relay as a broadcast and that it did not see any possibility of assigning it to the amateur radio service because of other users in the 900 megahertz range. In the meantime, the authority has asked the radio services to make proposals for the future use of the frequency range 174 to 230 megahertz, which will be used in Finland by March 31, 2021 for digital television broadcasts. 
The SRAL has now seized this opportunity and is proposing that the amateur radio service be able to use the 220 to 225 MHz subrange as an alternative to replace the lost 23 centimeter band. The 220 to 225 MHz allocation would correspond to the frequency allocation to the amateur radio services in Region 2. Several radio propagation experts will share their knowledge during a propagation summit via Zoom, sponsored by Contest University. The event is scheduled for January 23, 2021. The presentation schedule includes an update on the Personal Space Weather Station project and HAM SCI activities for 2021, hosted by Nathaniel Frizzell, W2NAF, at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, or 1600 UTC. Solar Cycle 25 predictions in progress with Carl Neutral Schwab, K9LA, at noon or 1700 UTC. Maximizing performance of HF antennas and irregular terrain, hosted by Jim Brakall, WA3FET, at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or 1800 UTC. And HF ionospheric propagation with Frank Donovan, W3LPL, at 2 p.m. EST or 1900 UTC. Registration is free, and ICOM IC705 will be raffled off as a donor prize. The winner must be present on Zoom to win. A lot of work is going on at the International Amateur Radio Union concerning the 23 centimeter band. It's proposed that the band be shared between radio amateurs and commercial radio navigation satellite systems. The commercial users are raising concerns about the potential for interference to their systems caused by amateurs. A significant technical investigation is now gathering pace. The chair of IARU Region 1 Spectrum Affairs, Barry Lewis, Gulf 4 Sierra Juliet Hotel, reports that the IARU is fully engaged in the 23 centimeter band Galileo Radio Navigation Satellite Service coexistence studies by the European Conference of Postal and Telecommunication Administrations, better known to us as CEPT. Throughout 2020, the IARU has been busily contributing to and participating in the work of CEPT Project Team SE40 concerning the 23 centimeter band and the Galileo GLONASS coexistence topic. The project team conducts technical studies relating to space services under the direction of the Spectrum Engineering Working Group and was assigned the task at the beginning of 2020. During this year, the IARU Region 1 has supplied seven written contributions and two information documents, providing the necessary details of amateur applications and activities specific to the 23 centimeter band to enable the working group to carry out the coexistence studies. The last working group meeting in 2020 was held from the 2nd to the 7th of December, and the IARU Region 1 was represented by Barry G4 Sierra Juliet Hotel. At that meeting, the draft project team working document was further developed with the addition of the Galileo ground-based receiver protection criteria which are needed for the coexistence studies. Without these criteria, no meaningful studies have been possible. However, now it can be expected that the technical studies will begin in earnest as we move forward in 2021. This work is also important in the global preparations for the next World Radio Conference where this topic is on the agenda. To address this, the ITU-R study group working parties 4C and 5A are working on the issue, but with a wider scope covering the global set of radio navigation satellite systems operating in the band 1240 to 1300 MHz. The IARU supports the action to do this work in CEPT, but continues to hold a view that the potential for interference being caused by the amateur and amateur satellite services to the radio navigation satellite systems in the shared 23 centimeter band is being overstated. According to Science Magazine, an international team headed by a scientist has announced the development of a solar cell that has beat the world record for efficiency. The research center Helmholtz Zentrum Berlin said that the development of a percussivite silicon tandem solar cell has created a 29.15% efficiency, pushing it ahead of the existing maximum of 28%. This is an important increase in the amount of energy produced using the same amount of sunshine hitting the same surface area. The efficiency rating means that these panels convert 29.15% of incident light into electrical energy.
The researchers are encouraged that they will reach their long-range target of more than 30 percent. Silicon cells are the global standard used in solar farms, and it has been developed separately from percussivite as a semiconductor for solar panels. The researchers published paper on the development calls the tandem solar cells a promising option. The researchers also noticed that combining the two semiconductors doesn't notably increase the cost of the panel's manufacture. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. I wanted to take some time to cover some of the common topics related to installing antenna systems on towers. First, let's examine designing and installing an antenna mount for the side of a smaller tower, like the one in your yard. I have built a few homemade mounts out of scrap pieces of steel, usually built from a three-quarter inch steel pipe about three feet long and three steel bars about one to two inches across, maybe a quarter inch thick. Material like this can often be purchased off the shelf from your local hardware store or welding shop. You will need to climb the tower to measure the sizes and dimensions of the tower, legs, and diagonal members where you intend to mount the sidearm you're building. If you do not have access to a welder, have the shop weld together the mount with the ends of the straps onto the pipe, with about a, a foot between the straps, which would be centered on the three-foot pipe. This will give you about a foot above and below the straps onto which you can side mount or end mount an antenna. Pre-drill the holes for U-bolts to mount the straps onto the tower legs. Then also do the same for the U-bolts at the furthest end of the straps from the mounting tube. This mount should be set across one entire face of the tower, so it can be hinged inward during mounting or servicing. After the mount is set in place and the antenna is set on the mount, the third support strap can be clamped to the mount and tower to reduce wobble. This is not a suitable mount for a wide tower unless you intend to mount the antenna close to the tower. The most common rule for mounting distance is one half wavelength from the closest face of the tower. If done properly, would make the tower nearly electrically transparent to the incoming or outgoing signals. If you draw a sine wave on a piece of paper, you'll notice that the voltage at one half wavelength is zero. This is why we prefer to mount antennas at multiples of one half wavelength. At two meters, that equals one meter out, or 39 inches from the antenna to the closest face on the tower. Imagine the sidearm necessary for six meters. At 224 megahertz, it equals about 24 inches for a half wave distance. If you have done all your measurements accurately at the mounting site, you can assemble the entire structure on the ground and make sure it all fits before taking any of it into the air. Since my homemade mounts usually weigh less than 15 pounds, I usually carry them up the tower with me, set them in place, then bring up the antennas and feed lines. This plan would change depending upon the height of the tower, other antennas on the tower, or how you feel about carrying cargo up the side of the tower safely. Sometimes it's easy, other times there would be too much risk of touching other active antennas, which would make hoisting the mount and antenna by rope from the ground necessary. It is obvious here that pre-planning is essential to ensure safety and reduce the number of trips up and down the tower. While I have promoted the idea of wearing cargo up the tower, I'm the first to admit that limiting trips on the tower and hours on the tower are the real goal in any job I do. Limiting both man hours and movement will also limit the risk of death, which is cool. I've seen a few different methods of securing amateur size coax to a tower leg. The most common I've seen is regular plastic electrical tape. The biggest problem with electrical tape is its lifespan. Mother Nature works to remove the sticky from electrical tape within the first half year. I've also seen cable ties used. As far as I know, clear or white cable ties are not made to survive sunlight, ozone, or Mother Nature's worst, which limit these to about seven months or less, especially if they are flexed regularly. I think the black cable ties are the best for outdoor mounting. Lastly, I've seen 12 gauge solid wire with insulation cut to five inch lengths and wrapped around the tower leg and coax, then twisted. I know this type of scrap material to hold coax to a tower leg for decades with no visible sign of aging. 
I have also seen a black cable tie over several layers of electrical tape. And coax can change size and length during the day, so always allow for these changes. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. The Reverse Beacon Network is taking advantage of a grant from the Osme Foundation in cooperation with Amateur Radio Digital Communications to add 15 more nodes. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has more details. RBN is a global system of software-defined radio receivers that monitor amateur radio bands and report CW, RTTY, and FT4 and FT8 signals to a central searchable database. In October, a YASME-funded node was successfully installed in Tunisia, bolstering RBM representation in Northern Africa. Additional modes are planned for Algeria and Libya. The success of this small program led to the Global 15 node project to expand the RBN into such underrepresented areas as the Caribbean, the South Pacific, Central Asia, the Middle East, and South America. YASME Foundation President Ward Silver, N0AX, said, By adding stations in these areas, the network's data quality and coverage will be improved to allow better analysis of events and openings beyond what was previously available. The large and growing database of records supports scientific research and allows hams to be more effective on the air and in planning operations and station design, Silver said. Selections for locations of the nodes were guided by the research community at HAMSI, whose website provides a forum for researchers and amateurs to interact and conduct studies and experiments. Silver said researchers are particularly interested in the reverse beacon network data because it covers such a wide area with so many stations, a capability unusual in research. Silver also noted that the reverse beacon network project has resulted in many volunteers working together around the globe. The Reverse Beacon Network team deserves a lot of credit for creating an important asset that combines amateur radio and science in the best traditions of both, he said. We look forward to helping keep that spirit alive and well. You are listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Judging by the list of more than 700 registered participants, Sky One Recognition Day on December 5th was a success. With more on Sky One Recognition Day 2020, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this story from League Headquarters in Newington. Co-sponsored by ARRL and the National Weather Service, SRD recognizes radio amateurs for the vital public service they provide during severe weather. Participants ranged from National Weather Service offices, radio amateurs, non-amateur weather spotters, and non-skyworn spotters. Radio amateurs comprise a large percentage of skyworn volunteers across the country. They provide vital communication between National Weather Service offices and emergency managers in the event that telecommunication systems are knocked out. 
Given the COVID-19 pandemic, SRD was handled a little differently than it has been in the past. Normally, radio amateurs participate from home stations and from stations at National Weather Service forecast offices, trying to contact as many other National Weather Service forecast offices as possible. This year, participation from National Weather Service forecast offices was minimal, and the focus shifted to contacting as many Skywarn trained spotters as possible. New this year, SRD was open to all Skywarn spotters, and a Skywarn Recognition Day Facebook page was created. The National Weather Service Milwaukee Forecast Office reported more than 150 contacts logged across 35 states. The National Weather Service Office in Springville, Missouri, tweeted, What would Skywarn Recognition Day be without a special thanks to the net control operators? The National Weather Service Office in Chicago tweeted, Skywarn Recognition Day has come to an end, thanking everyone for attending and to all our spotters across the nation. Skywarn Recognition Day planner and organizer Michael Lewis, KG4KJQ, who is the Warning Coordination Meteorologist in the Northern Indiana National Weather Service Forecast Office, expressed appreciation to the Sky One Recognition Day planning team and the Facebook live stream presenters for helping to make the event a success. The National Weather Service Forecast Office in Northern Indiana registered 34 radio amateurs. The office serves 37 counties in Northern Indiana, Southwest Lower Michigan, and Northwest Ohio. And now with our final story to close out this week's news from Southgate Vibes, here's Steve Richards, G4HPE. In the comfortable world of communications we inhabit today, the idea that the internet might just disappear is almost unimaginable. But this could, and indeed it does happen, in parts of the world that are at risk from natural disasters, particularly if their infrastructure is not a robust one. So what do you do if the internet ceases to work because of a hurricane that has struck a remote island or an earthquake that has caused a failure of power supplies over a wide area? Well, one team has been working on a simple system that is designed to address exactly this situation. LoRa stands for Long Range and it's a spread spectrum modulation technique devised by Semtech. Their LoRa devices and radio frequency technology comprises a long-range, low-power wireless platform that has become the de facto technology for the Internet of Things networks worldwide. As a society, we've become accustomed to high-speed data connections that are permanently available, whether we're at our home computer or out and about with a mobile device. But what happens if a natural disaster knocks out the local infrastructure? Well, we radio hams will be able to fire up our radios, hopefully, to reach out to people. But only a minority have this sort of facility. What we really need is a backup internet. The team behind the Cell Sol project hopes to show that building a volunteer-operated distributed communications network is not only within capabilities, but is probably much easier and cheaper to do than you might think. Each node in the network, known as a pylon in cell sol parlance, can shuttle data between the LoRa backbone and Wi-Fi enabled devices like smartphones and computers. Once the network is up and running, users don't need any special hardware or software to use it. Now, to be clear, nobody is talking about surfing the web here. When a user connects to one of the pylons, known as ESP32s, they'll be able to access a simplistic chat system through their browser. If the pylon has an active internet connection, the chat can be bridged to an internet relay chat channel, that's an IRC. Without internet connectivity, the pylon will simply give users on the CellSol network a means to communicate amongst each other. To keep things simple, there are no usernames, private messages or encryption. This is bare bones, end of the world style communication. If you want to have a play with the cell sol system, all you really need is an ESP32 pylon, a LoRa radio, and the open source firmware. If you get something like the Helltech LoRa 32 development board, you don't even need to solder anything together. Just flash the board and go. Once you have a few pylons going, you can also put together a cheap repeater node using a LoRa equipped Arduino. Both devices are small and energy efficient enough that they could easily be battery or solar powered. The development team even envisioned a future where such devices could be dropped off in public areas via a drone. 
This isn't the first time we've seen the ESP32 pylon used to establish an off-grid communications network, and like those previous attempts, its usefulness will largely depend on how many people you can convince to set up their own nodes and repeaters. But if you've got some like-minded friends who live relatively close by, this could be a great way to have a chat. You can read the full story at hackaday.com, and our thanks go to Stephen, Golf 7 Victor, Foxtrot, Yankee, for this information. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD Repeater System on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.